Now luck yet send me, and a little wit will serve to make my vid a hit! Maybe. This is Welcome to Shake Tube Warm Up 2019, where I'm, this month of August, I'm reading uh, Shakespeare's Contemporaries. Uh, this week, this week it is, I'm reading the play Volpone or the Fox by Ben Johnson. Volpone? Volpone, probably. Volpone by uh, Ben Johnson. See, I haven't even prepared that yet. Uh, Yes, so we're, this is an all in a warm up to, uh, ShakeTube, which I will send the links down all down below where, uh, three, uh, three great booktubers are hosting, uh, a, a Shakespeare read along where they select plays and you can, can pick and choose or you can watch them all or you can read some of them and, or just, you know, all that sort of good Shakespearean stuff. So I wanted to kind of get sync into this, uh, get into the spirit, uh, early by reading some of Shakespeare's contemporaries and uh, just sort of get the feeling of like what was going on, what were the, what were his fellow playwrights doing? These are people that are all his contemporaries. Uh, ben Johnson, who I'm doing this week, was born in 1572, died in uh, 1637. So uh, it's pretty pretty contemporaneous with Shakespeare, who's of course dates I do not have around here. Uh, he's uh, Johnson is a bit of a is a younger man, younger man than Shakespeare. Um, and I'm doing the play of All Pony, which was performed in 1606 and published in uh, 1616. So Ben Johnson, uh, his, his father died a month before he was born. Uh, his stepfather was a master bricklayer. He uh, got a really good, really good education. Uh, one of the characteristics of Johnson actually is he was actually quite a formless, form, formidable uh, scholar, a uh, classicist. Uh, he in, indeed one of the criticisms, uh, especially when it's the compare and contrast with that damn Shakespeare, is that he was maybe a little too learned, a little bit too much laying on his. Uh, uh, his, his learning. Of course, I'm such an ignoramus that it all goes over my head, uh, one way or the other that way. Um, so he, but he didn't, he was going to an, attend a Cambridge, but ended up not doing that. Spent a little bit of time as a bricklayer, which apparently he really did not like. Uh, and then as a soldier in the Netherlands, where, uh, apparently you know, there's one of these stories is, you know, Johnson seems to be it's one of these guys with the stories. Um, he had a single. He engaged in a single combat and and killed a dude for his his uh, kind of the the spoils. This is uh, in the Netherlands. The British, the the English were in the Netherlands fighting the uh, Spanish Catholics. Uh, this is um this is the whole as I've said in other videos. This is Protestant England, and uh, they were sticking there or in uh fighting kind of this the reformation and all the kind of the bloodshed and headaches uh going <laughs> headaches going along with that um on return to on the on his return to england uh he worked as an actor and a playwright uh also he all through this he's also a major poet as well um he was the protagonist in uh Geronimo, uh in the play uh, the spanish tragedy which i did on my very first week, uh, by uh, Thomas Kidd. So that was one of his one of his roles. This is, gives you the sense of the all these guys are kind of working together. And indeed, um, as we go along here, uh, Shakespeare's Company uh, with Shakespeare actually starring in at least two of two of Johnson's plays, um, starring or having roles in two of uh, Johnson's plays, produced uh, Johnson's work. So these guys, these are guys who. Um, even there's no kind of direct evidence that they were super best buds, but they were intimately like business wise, uh, relate, you know, um, working, working with each other, knew each other's stuff, uh, always, always influenced, um, you know, as poetry goes, um, he's, um, there's a couple of, a couple of his poems are done, uh, to, uh, his eldest daughter who died at six months, six months old and an eldest son who died at the, bubonic plague uh at at the age of seven uh, and he wrote wrote poems for both of them and there was this was a time when um london had like i think it's tripled in size in the in the in the past hundred years was a vibrant super commercial um commercial uh, thing there was all the roiling stuff of are we protestant are we catholic are we protestant um he Johnson is one of these guys who uh, seems to have gotten in trouble a lot. Uh, he was uh, he got in trouble for his plays. He was, he was imprisoned a couple of times for stuff he had written in his plays. Um, for was it lewd and mutinous behavior? Uh, and then in the time of James, he starts making fun. He 
makes fun of Scott's uh, protests that it wasn't he it was his co-author Nash who who wrote that parts, but he ended up getting in prison for that. Uh, he was charged with killing a man in a duel. And uh, indeed, he pled, he pled guilty. He pled guilty to that. Uh, apparently, it was something about non-payment of, uh, of 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 a debt or something like that. He pled guilty to it, but actually escaped uh, for reasons of what's it called? It's called um, for uh, benefit of clergy because uh, there was a rule saying that uh, I guess it, it had applied just to the clergy, but then got applied to more people. That if you could uh, read and write in Latin. Uh, that um, you 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 would get you would get let off. It was basically kind of a way of clemency for probably um, the part of society where oh we'll give you clemency because you're kind of you're educated. Uh, and indeed he was let off and his uh, thumb was branded. And uh, I, I didn't see the actual things. Apparently you would get branded a T for theft, F for felon, and M for murder. So uh, Johnson was a really rough and tumble guy, branded branded as a murderer, uh, or I don't know if that was well. Branded, branded for, branded for the thing. Uh, he also converted to Catholicism. If you want to talk about how much of an appetite he was for trouble, uh, he, he actually converted to Catholicism while in prison. And this is in the middle of, you know, they're actually, he was a soldier going to fight the Spanish Catholics. This is like, he got, and he got heavy pressure, uh, heavy grief for this of, um, for his Catholicism and indeed was accused a couple of times of popery in his, uh, in his plays because of it and uh, only ended up um, kind of um, converting back to Protest to, uh, to the church of England uh, because of uh, there was a, like an assassination of a hen of a, of a, a French, French King Henry the fourth. I'm going to go with who was, who while wasn't Protestant himself had shown, um, had shown, um, uh, toleration for the Protestants in in uh, France at the time, so he finally did he finally did convert back again. Um, also, you want to talk about trouble? Uh, this guy sat down to dinner with basically the terrorists of the day. Uh, he sat down for a dinner with this is when he was still a Catholic with um, with uh, these fellow Catholics who weren't too happy, one of them was Guy Fox. Uh, this is the gunpowder plot where uh, they caught Guy Fox uh, underneath. I think it's underneath the House of Lords with like a ton of gunpowder. Uh, Guy Fox Day isn't just an excuse to let off fireworks. That is commemorating uh, what was like a major attempted assassination of the king, and you know, basically blowing up the whole society because these uh, Roman Catholic Englishmen. Were really just were really disappointed with uh, the new king James the first um, coming to the throne. They were going to hope they were going to hope for uh, that things were going to be easier under him than they were under Elizabeth, uh, and they were disappointed. So disappointed they were trying to kill kill him. This I mean you get this whole thing of oh they're imprisoning people. They're, the government of the time is imprisoning people and torturing people, and on this side of the things you have jokers like this who are trying to blow up. House of Lords uh, with the King and Lords inside. So, yes, yes. Um, so, uh, what else do I have? Um, you know, uh, the big things of Shakespeare. Uh, he actually wrote a um, he wrote a poem that opens uh, Shakespeare's first folio to the memory of my beloved, uh, the author, Mister William Shakespeare, and what he has left us. And you know, it basically it did a lot. It did a lot to sort of frame Shakespeare from the beginning as um, sort of a natural genius. Uh, there's a lot of ways that maybe Johnson was trying to kind of push his own case forward. It's like, oh well, Shakespeare's like a natural genius, though you know he's he's got his points. He's got his points, but you know, I am a learned classical classical erudite fellow who isn't as maybe as appreciated by those those dolts of the public because he had some problems with the audiences not appreciating exactly how 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 great he was um yeah yet i must not i yet i must not give nature all thy art my gentle shakespeare must enjoy a part <laughs> oh, it's nice of him enjoy a part so yes let's get on to the play now that i'm almost 10 minutes into this what's probably going to be a half an hour video buckle in folks of of volpone um the genre it's a comedy uh it's um i i i see i'm gonna make some old movie references which you have to be probably have to be old i think about like dirty rotten scoundrels uh steve martin and uh steve martin and uh michael kane and uh and uh glenn headley 
1988 comedy where it's like the, the, basically the play is like, you know, two confidence people probably, cro- you know, it's a comedy that way, but it's, you could kind of cross it with something like the grifters, which is the much more black, dark thing. This is, it's a comedy, but it's a comedy with a very dark, nasty turn to it. Uh, and it's not, it doesn't end like a comedy, but I'll get, I'll get to that at the end. The setting of this is in Venice. Uh, Venice was um, apparently the one of the major kind of commercial rivals to London. So if you're going to set a play, if you're going to talk, do a play about kind of like ah uh, the corruption, the g- greed and lust, and you don't want to get in trouble in London where you've gotten locked up for other stuff, well then you're going to say, oh no, I'm talking about Venice, these Catholic foreigners over here, and which is what he which is what he does. He, oh, this seems to be a kind of a common thing with you see that in Shakespeare. Uh, a lot of times is, oh, I'm not going to set the play in, you know, right now. I'll set it either in historical times or I'll set it in historical times somewhere else to try and fend off the censors and hopefully not get as people as upset with me because I'm actually talking about contemporary times. This is all stuff that's pointing at the people right now. Um, the characters, uh, main character, Volponi. Uh, this is, he is the, he is this very, he is a very rich man, uh, but he doesn't get off on, he doesn't get off on his, his riches as much as he gets off on the acquisition of his riches and using his wit to gull others, others out of their wealth. Uh, his parasite, Mosca, uh, kind of also the, fl- the, fl- the fly, Mosca, who is his, his basically his co-conspirator, uh, the, the one he shares all his plans with. And they have a great relationship in this play of they, they actually, they're, they're, they're two tricksters. They're two, they're two guys who are like, you know, we're going to gull the suckers and manipulate them and, and just how they love each other, uh, in a way that's almost, it's almost to the point of it's, it's a romantic relationship in a way. There's the three greedy d- dudes who, um, this play has got very much the thing of uh the, the three greedy dudes are kind of characterized as as these birds these you know they're they want to feed off of volponi's corpse because volponi in this play we'll get to the plot in a second but they want to feed off his corpse and and uh so they're cr- characterized as crows ravens um and we're going to gull them you know fool them trick them and to the money uh there's some british tourists just to maybe kind of give you an idea like oh this is contemporary uh we've got uh celia one of the um uh, one of the one of the greedy do one of the wives of the greedy greedy dudes and she is kind of a very oh, virtuous virtuous young woman uh kind of character um in some ways you wonder if, if if johnson seems to be kind of making fun of her virtuousness um and uh, a bon- oh, Bonanno, I can't remember his. Okay, I'm gonna look that up right now. His, uh, the uh, son of one of the, uh, another, a son of one of the other other greedy dudes. Uh, I am. We're just. It's going to drive me crazy if I don't do him. Bonario, Bonario. I'll go with Bonario. We'll, we'll we'll pretend I'm saying it right there. And Bonario, a kind of a upright dude, maybe kind of a little too upright and dudish in his way. So yes, the plot of this book is Volponi uh, at the be- at the beginning going like, well, I'm going to pretend I'm sick and enfeebled and that, and all these greedy, rich greedy dudes are going to gather around and they're going to try and curry my favor. They're going to give me lots of gifts in hopes that they'll get their gifts back and they'll inherit all my all my fortune um, through the thing. And indeed, this is a play where, um, at least at the beginning, you very much side with Volponi in the sense of like, yes, okay, you're an amoral bastard, but you're an amoral bastard who's going after these rich, greedy assholes and you're going to gull them out of their money. And we, as the audience are going to kind of enjoy, enjoy that, enjoy that kind of, uh, that, that thing. And then, and yes, Moscow is kind of, is, is both, is both kind of a, a, is both kind of a, a surrogate is, is both kind of a surrogate for the audience, but also just like, ah, someone else we can kind of bounce off of. And indeed he actually does as much kind of the plotting as Volponi does. Volponi does a lot of times just lying back in bed, kind of ill while Mosca kind of does the stuff. And you can see that it's a really cool interplay uh, where you see Mosca rising further and further as the play goes along until maybe the inevitable thing that happens with uh, tricksters and confidence men is that, that that happens. Now I kind of mentioned in this in this book that you know the um, that 
they, they're they're all kind of given kind of animal names. Volpone is 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 fox. Mosca is fly, and the, there's the these are the birds. It's all like they're given kind of very animalistic base names. Um, and there's sort of there's references to Aesop's fable in here as well as uh, it's Renard, uh, which is a kind of trickster fox figure, um, actual talking fox, and kind of fable fable uh, history going back a long, long time in uh, Europe. European tradition and indeed that's all kind of mixed in there in this in this um this plot um here let me just read the opening speech of this is Volponi awakening and uh what he the first thing he does is opens his shrine ah good morning to the day and next my gold open the shrine that I may see my saint and Mosca reveals the treasure opens the opens his treasure chest hail the world's soul and mine more glad than the teeming earth to see the longed for sun peep through the horns of celestial ram am i to view thy splendor darkening his that lying here amongst my other hordes showest like a flame by night or like the day struck out of chaos when all darkness fled unto the center o thou son of soul but brightness, but brighter than thy father, let me kiss with adoration thee and every relic of sacred treasure in this blessed room. And it's like, ah, uh, and uh, there's some readings of Volponi where they say, oh, he's a miser, but it's like, no, he's just like, uh, he loves, he loves his gold, but he loves acquiring his gold. And, and indeed he gets more excited by tricking people than he does by, by money, by sex, by anything else, it's power, that power over people, being able to kind of look into their souls and see their, their, uh, their sin, their, their weaknesses and exploit that for his, exploit that for his own gain. Um, so I have to say when, as I was reading this play, uh, I found a, I found a bit of the pacing kind of a problem here. Uh, it, um, it does drag in places and a part of that might just be my, my ignorance, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Johnson, is, is, is that, you know, you feel like it could be snappier and you can see that, I mean, I guess like, you know, with Shakespeare, you see whenever there's a production, they rapidly hack down a lot of stuff. They both shorten, shorten, tighten things to kind of make it a driving live experience for us, uh, low, low, uh, attention span mortals. And, uh, I did find that reading this play. It took me a while to kind of get through it. I found there was some, I oftentimes like picking up and reading a bit at night and it was just like, uh, okay. And I have to shut it and kind of come back to it. Um, when I watched a production of it, actually it was just kind of a very kind of a local, local production. Um, not local, a, a kind of a, a, a community theater production of it. They, they chopped it down and it actually, it, 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 kind of clips along as this confidence thing, as this, as this kind of a comedy thing. Um, it is very much a, a satire. It's this, you know, uh, what was happening in London, what was happening in Venice is this kind of new kind of capitalism. These aren't lords and ladies. These are people of business. Uh, there's a lawyer, there's, um, oh, I, you know, the, 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 these are people of finance. This is not, this is not, oh, I've inherited my money and I don't really care about money. These, these are greedy guys who are, they're hustling. They're, they're they've got, they've amassed their wealth through acquisition. Um, and you know, the, 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 the very much, um, you get, you get with, uh, Volponi, he's, you can see him kind of, you feel him like kind of turning to the audience and saying, ah, ah, you're like this too. You like money. You, you do. And, you know, it's kind of indicting, indicting the people in it. Um, and also just, um, just like kind of the nature of power relationships. Um, some of the quotes, uh, Mosca at one point, who is, you know, he's called the parasite. And he says, almost, almost all the wise world is little else in nature, but parasites or sub parasites. And you get that thing of, yes, we're all leeching off of each other. It's like, um, it's definitely not kind of a loving, giving, giving world uh, that that were that he's presenting here this is a world where everyone is sucking off of each other there's a big there's the big guy and then there's a flea on him and then there's a flea on the flea and we're all just sucking sucking the blood out of each other that that thing um or there's now a, a, a part of this and and in this play uh we have a uh, Volponi he yes he wants a wealth but he also he loves the trickery of things and when he hears that one of the um one of the greedy old dude has a beautiful young wife sight unseen he's like oh I want to get her too he's like you know lure her to me let's come up with a 
let's come up with a trick to get her into my bed. Um, and uh, indeed, they get the they they convince the husband because I guess one of the myths is you 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 put a uh, it's a young virgin put him put her in bed with a sick with a sick man and that will help cure him. So it's like oh they're afraid that somebody else one of the other people circling is going to get that going to get a woman in 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 bed with aged old I'm going to die of a pony and uh, no the, the the husband who is a super misogynistic. Um, and his and his wife is like you know well what, what about like you know what about your honor and he's he uh, Corvino says honor tut a breath there's no such thing in nature a mere term invented to off fools what is my goal the worse for touching clothes being looked on why this is no worse and indeed this is kind of like this is also the thing of a view on women I don't know I don't know if you say that Johnson has this view but definitely the characters in this play have the view of. Um, yeah, you have gold, you have clothing, and you have women as 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 strictly as possessions. Um, there's something that you know Vol Volponi doesn't need to know that he wants this woman before he's just he's heard the report of her. She's valuable in that sort of way, and indeed, when she is finally kind of thrust into his bed, he starts off by doing the seduction thing. But when she doesn't respond to his seduction, she refuses it. Like you know, heaven forfend, kind of heaven's you know why you know please kill me versus dishonoring me this way he's like well no i'm just gonna take you by force then um which is where you get really into i guess the very it's like wow he's 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 been despicable before but now he's being despicable to another human being but it's obviously it's a human being that he doesn't consider a human being it's almost like if they dropped a bag of gold in his bed and the bag of gold had said you know don't 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 violate me. It's like he would take he would take that bag of gold's uh, protest as as seriously as he would take uh, Celia's protest. Um, which you know I think that's where we get we get the turn. And in, interesting, it's that it's in that turn that things have been going pretty swimmingly for Volpone and uh, Mosca up until that point. But that's the point where things snap, and it's not really the the rape as much as it as they attempted rape. As it is the fact that, oh crap, it's going to get out that Volponi isn't infirm and it's going to screw up all their plans that way. It's not even really about, oh, he was going to try and, you know, rape this young woman. It's like, oh crap, they're going to find out all my other subterfuge and I'm going to be exposed as a fraud, as a fraud that way. Um, but yeah, it's, it, um, there's some very, very dark things for women. Uh, earlier when, um, when, uh, Corvino su suspects Celia, Cecilia, Celia of having of, of of having even maybe slightly flirted with some some guy he says nay steer stay hear this let me not prosper whore but I will take thee I will make thee an anatomy dissect thee mine own self and read a lecture upon thee to the city and in public which is the practice of dissecting corpses uh in public for kind of public edification and it's like he's pulled a knife on her earlier and i mean it's it's one of these bizarre things of you get some things like okay this is it's like it's funny the things that you make you go oh this is a different time because this is this is uh while it's it's johnson's really good at making this also horrifying he also is playing this you know a certain way for laughs like i can see an actor i did see an actor uh play this for laughs like it was it was slightly run through and he was kind of made blustery but it's like there's like, wow, just kind of like the violence in there, uh, which let's just kind of go. Uh, let me run, run to the, run to the end here of uh, the ending. The ending of this play to me was a surprise because uh, I'm used to a modern comedy and like, you know, oh, the confidence guys, what happens to confidence guys at the end of movies like this? And no, this one has uh, a darker, darker ending that way, which I will not spoil, to, but just to say, it's like, oh, that was, that was that was that was interesting um so yeah i mean reading an old comedy i think is harder than reading an old tragedy just because what's it's like tragedy is something that seems to uh can be something that um it's it's funny because this play actually hits a lot of ways of like you know greed and lust and um uh having this husband who kind of spouts stuff that's like wow you know uh, vile stuff about women, unfortunately still timeless. Um, but there's other stuff that just, you don't get that. It's hard to kind of connect with, with 
with old comedy, harder to connect, harder to connect with old comedy than it is with old tragedy because tragedy is tragedy is tragedy. Which is to say, next week, <laughs> let's let's grab my segue and run away with it. Um, we're back to tragedy. I'm going to be doing The Duchess of Malfi, uh, first performed in 1614, published in 1623 by John Webster, who's uh, born 1580, question mark, uh, died 1625, question mark, uh, and was the son of a London tailor, which seems to be the big big little biographic fact that they actually know about the dude. Uh, so yeah, that'll be my, that will be my final, final video, uh, warming up to, uh, shake, shake tube, uh, coming in September, which is hosted by, uh, Jason at old blues chapter and verse, uh, Luke Cash at total, totally pretentious and Steve Donahue at Steve Donahue. And I will put links down below to all their announcement videos for, uh, for that. And, uh, though they've also announced like kind of what, what uh, plays that you can kind of pick from to 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 uh, to read along with them or watch along with them? I uh, I'll put a link down below of the um, I'll put a, two links down below. One link to uh, just kind of a theater production doing the play because I I find even if it's kind of pretty rudimentary, um, it really makes a difference showing it. And I'll also put a link uh, put a link down below to oh God if I can find the piece of thing of of this video called Performing Johnson uh, Volponi, uh, which is from the uh, University of York uh, web, their YouTube channel, um, which has actor Henry Goodman uh, in rehearsal with uh, Professor Mike Cordner, uh, who is a Johnson scholar. And uh, Henry Goodman uh, is a Royal Shakespearean Company actor. And uh, them kind of going through just that opening, that opening monologue of a Volponi, uh, and, and just like, how, how do you read it? It was like, it was really fascinating. I think it's one of these things of, um, uh, it's really benefit, especially when you're a first time reader to a uh, first time consum consuming a play to, to let an actor do the reading for you the first time. And then you can go back and you can kind of input your, your own readings, your own interpretations, because they go through this first first speech and kind of go through it line by line and just kind of bringing out meanings, uh, very much the kind of the poetics, uh, the, the Im implications like, and then like, how, how would, how would I perform this as an actor? Uh, and, uh, uh, Goodman doing, ending up doing kind of three readings through of this. And apparently, yes, he, he went on with the Royal Shakespeare company to do a uh, production of, of Opone and, uh, I, I would have been, I would have been cool to see. Um, unfortunately I could not find anything like that at the library. I found a humble, but very serviceable, uh, production of that. Actually, I don't think actually it's not on YouTube. I'll put the link down below. I think it's Vimeo or something like that, where thank you very much to those people for putting on that. That was a, that was a very useful thing for me because, uh, um, reading a play is one thing, but actually seeing it kind of performed even very kind of crudely is just amazing. And, uh, you know, as by my reading, you can see that I can't even rise to the, I can't even rise to crudely. So yes, with all that, I will see you next week. I guess if you got this far uh, and more videos later.